Welcome to this worship service of the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Shelter Rock. We welcome you wherever you are right now watching this service. I'm Janet Benderwitz, pronouns she, hers, and I'm a Shelter Rock member and worship associate. I extend the welcome of our ministers, Reverend Jay Brooks, Reverend Jennifer Brower, and our lead minister, Reverend Dr. Natalie Fenimore. Our music director is Stephen Michael Smith. This morning, I joyfully welcome Cassandra Montenegro, our guest worship leader. Cassie is a second year Master of Divinity student at Harvard Divinity School, where she serves as a chaplain intern for the Office of Religious and Spiritual Life. She is a member of the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Miami and is active in the People of Color Caucus of the First Parish UU Congregation in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Cassie is a recipient of the Marjorie Bowens Wheatley Scholarship by the Unitarian Universalist Women's Federation and is a recent Harvard Divinity School Billings Preaching Prize finalist. As a congregation, we seek to create loving religious community, encourage spiritual growth, and build a more just and joyful world. We mark this special time each Sunday morning to restore the balance of our spirits, to celebrate the joys of life, and to find the strength to meet life's challenges and sorrows. This morning, we continue to explore this month's learning and worship theme, Holding History. Everyone is invited to our online coffee hour at 11.45 to meet new friends and see the faces of the friends you are missing. Let us take a moment to ground ourselves in time and place. Hearing the music as a call to quiet the noise and static of daily life and allow the spirit to emerge. <laughs>
Hello again to you good people and friends of the Unitarian Universalist Congregation at Shelter Rock. My name is Cassie Montenegro. I am a second year student at Harvard Divinity School, and I'm so grateful to be with you again in your virtual sacred space. A special thanks to Stephen Smith, to those of Penny Lane, to Aaron Hawley, and to Reverend Brooks for the invitation, collaboration, and ongoing support. We seminarians cannot do it without you and without congregations like yours. Thank you for being who you are, for listening, for giving this space, and with such open hearts. The words of today's chalice lighting were written by Santa Teresa de Jesus, more popularly known in our times as Saint Teresa of Avila, a Catholic mystic and, I'd like to say, badass reformer. These words are from the book of her life, a spiritual autobiography she was asked, or rather tasked, to write by her confessors as a means to protect her from the Spanish Inquisition. Women religious in her time were prohibited for certain kinds of learning and were, and were disbelieved for certain kinds of seeing. Teresa, as I will lovingly call her here today, learned and shared what she could as the spirit of life, of love, in, in her words, the spirit of God moved her. As we light our chalices, may we invite in the words of Teresa. It seems to me now, the soul is as though sailing with a very calm wind, for one travels far without understanding how. For then the desires are restless and the soul never succeeds in being satisfied. This is the experience of those to whom God gives the great impulses of love. Like some little springs I've seen flowing, they never cease to move the sand upward. Love is always stirring and thinking about what it will do. Each Sunday, we light the chalice of our religious heritage. We do this for our ancestors, who taught us through their various religious traditions and by their actions for justice and hope. We do this for our children who are learning the traditions we teach and who will learn more from our actions and our words. We do this for ourselves to remind us of who we are and who we seek to become. This flame symbolizes the light of truth, the warmth of community and the fire of commitment. Yeah.
The congregation's words of affirmation express the purpose and intention for our gathering in religious community. If you are in accord with the words that appear on the screen, please speak them along with me. Love is the doctrine of this congregation. The quest of truth is its sacrament and service is its prayer. To dwell together in peace, to seek knowledge in freedom, to serve human need. This do we affirm and covenant with each other. To serve human need. Each Sunday, we take a special collection to support a group that helps others in our local community. During this holiday season, we're continuing our special collection to support the North Shore Soup Kitchen and the Aid Centre of Queens County. Your donations have provided needy families with meals for Thanksgiving this week, and additional donations will do so for the December holidays. Please donate through our website online by sending a text or through PayPal. During her life as a Carmelite nun, Teresa experienced a number of illnesses and a number of mystical visions. None is as ingrained in the history of Western art and our wider cultural consciousness as the one drawn from the following passage from the book of her life. The soul seeks ways and means of doing something about the love of God it feels. But this pain of love is so great that I don't know what bodily torment would take it away. The Lord wanted me while in this state to see sometimes the following vision. I saw close to me toward my left sighed an angel in bodily form. I usually don't see angels in bodily form except on rare occasions, although many times angels appear to me, but without my seeing them. This time though, the Lord desired that I see the vision in the following way. The angel was not large, but small. He was very beautiful and his face was so aflame that he seemed to be one of those very sublime angels that appear to be all afire. I saw in his hands a large golden dart, and at the end of the iron tip, there appeared to be a little fire. It seemed to me this angel plunged the dart several times into my heart and that it reached deep within me. When he drew it out, I thought he was carrying off with him the deepest part of me. And he left me all on fire with great love of God. The pain was so great that it made me moan. And the sweetness this greatest pain caused me was so superabundant that there is no desire capable of taking it away. Nor is the soul content with less than God. 
The pain is not bodily, but spiritual, although the body doesn't fail to share in some of it, and even a great deal. The loving exchange that takes place between the soul and God is so sweet that I beg him in his goodness to give a taste of this love to anyone who thinks I am lying. Today's sermon, as one of my loved ones informed me as I was writing it, is about love and going against the grain. And I would say, creating safe enough spaces to risk, to love. As we navigate this holiday season, many of us find ourselves struggling to be open and vulnerable. Often met with the demands of those around us, many of us find ourselves seeking a renewed place of solace amidst the living histories of our lives. I say living histories because each of us is the result of stories that are intertwined and ever evolving. The parents who met at a party and who still argue about toothpaste years later. The grandparents who chose to fight and flee from a revolution and are now battling the pain of other losses. The great grandparents whose stories continue to intrigue and beguile us into even greater ancestral digging into our own past and present complicities in white supremacy. Some of these stories are surfaced at dinner tables and some are still waiting to be served. As Unitarian Universalists, we draw from many traditions and rely on many sources of faith. Teresa of Avila, who renamed herself Teresa of Jesus, is one of these sources of history and of faith. A mystic poet from a converso Jewish family from, with a complex history, Teresa, who worked through illness, who deftly navigated her detractors, reformed a Catholic monastic order, and whose works we still read today, has a story, a history of her own. One that she got to tell, to a greater or lesser extent, in several texts throughout her life. Subject to male censors who were partially looking out for her, partially, and at times increasingly, looking out for their faith tradition, she wrote truth into the margins of history. Arguably, though one of the few female doctors of the Catholic Church and subject in the subject of one of the most famous works of art historical scholarship, the woman who renamed herself Teresa of Jesus of Jesus still remains a mystery. Within the past century, scholars have learned and uplifted that she was part of a Jewish family forced to convert to Catholicism a generation prior and that two of her brothers were part of colonizing the Americas, unable to gain greater social status in Spain because of their Jewish heritage. But Teresa does not write of that. If anything, parts of her own writing appear anti-Semitic on their face. Yet many of my peers continue to raise questions about how her own lineage, her own trauma could have affected her ethos but that is a topic for another day. Perhaps part of what we can learn today from Teresa is to embrace the space for mystery amidst our ever evolving history of our lives. And perhaps some of the greatest mysteries we hold are found in each one of us. For each of us is a story, a vessel for the sacred. As my professor, Reverend Dr. Stephanie Paulsell said in class earlier this week, each of us is a portable sacred space. This statement made me think of portable objects of veneration. It made me think of gilded reliquaries that hold a piece of divine within them. In the Middle Ages in Europe, much of the art was portable. There was a great deal of social instability, thus the object was not only a status symbol 
or a gift of devotion or furthering devotion, but also a means of to holding onto a piece of heritage, of history. In the book of her life, Teresa herself, who did come from some wealth and status, writes of a portable possession of her own that she carried with her as a child, according to her, and that influenced her life and work. A small painting of the Catholic gospel passage of a Samaritan woman at a well who lovingly gives water to God, unbeknownst to her. Under the painted image, there were words inscribed with a supplication in Latin, a language not Teresa's own, yet which she did re-inscribe in her, the book of her life. The prayer in translation for us, Lord, give me the water. Here, Teresa is drawing upon images from the religious art and stories of her childhood uh, in her converso family and making them her own. Even when Teresa felt herself weak, was met with great challenges, interior and exterior, and was both a product and a part of her history, her time, she found ways to leave herself open to the mysteries of love, of life. When Teresa writes of love, and for her there's no mistaking that it's the love of God, she writes of that water and she writes of fire. Two images that are found amongst others within this book of her life water and fire, two elements that might very well cancel the other out. She also writes of visions, mystical visions, that penetrate the soul, that leave a long-standing imprint on one's life. What is it, these moving waters, these little fires that move us, that cannot be quenched? Often, we may not be able to control them. Teresa herself writes that they are out of her own control. But her writing begs me to ask how I might be more open to a kind of love that cannot easily be quelled. Many of us here have likely had deeply moving experiences in our lives. Experiences that at times to others may seem hard to believe. Experiences where our hearts were so full that they felt too big to hold in a good way. It seems to me that, that experiences like those require an openness, a vulnerability, a fearlessness, containers of love held in spaces of deep trust. For Teresa, her faith rested in God and in prayer a God found in places and spaces of prayer, a God mitigated and indeed informed by her Catholic faith, yet not limited by its actors. Teresa learned to trust what she saw and intuited over the fear placed in her, potentially placed in her, by some of her male confessors ultimately placing her and some of those of her order at odds with the Spanish Inquisition. Teresa's writing, when read in the context of her life and ethos, elevates the power and potency of spiritual perception as a product of prayer. A time of focused quietude, of contemplation, of meditation that left her more open to the experiences that would allow her to have her well filled and her heart on fire, that would allow her to reform and order and create space for women and men all over Spain to connect to parts of themselves that were not entirely defined by their family names, their lineages, or their expected contributions to the demands of the outside world or the larger Catholic faith. What artistic images inspire your own spaces of contemplation or veneration, if any? 
The legacy and fame of Teresa herself inspired the artwork of Gian Lorenzo Bernini, who made one of her many mystical experiences the subject of a sculpture that has elicited much debate. Rife with the theatrical male gaze, this theatrical work casts an arguably erotic female figure in the throes of divine love. Sculpted patrons and other male figures look on from either side as she is suspended in agony under a flame-holding angel. Heavenly light pouring from the skylight down the metal rays and bathing her as she swims, suspended in the chapel. She is forever on display in a moment of mystical veneration, of truth for all others to see. Bernini's Teresa has been echoed most recently in the work of contemporary South African artist, William Kentridge, in his 2016 mural, Triumphs and Laments, a procession across time. Yet Kentridge's Teresa is arguably more fit for our time, tethered to history. Sure, she wears the swirling robes that Bernini gave her, but with Kentridge, she sits atop the head of the Dacians plucked from the column of Trajan. We see the rays of light above her, possibly an allusion to God, yet the angel with the flaming arrow is absent. As is almost any reference to the supernatural and the spectators, the patrons, perhaps passerbys are the only ones left on the ground to witness her image crumbling as they walk across the river Tiber. Is our Teresa crumbling? She in ecstasy or she somewhere else? tethered or untethered. Some of us may be feeling a bit untethered at the moment, disconnected from one another, from our families, and even from parts of ourselves. Where might our own openness come from? Or is the question, the context, too foreign, too frightening, or just too darn exhausting to even fathom? I am not sure when I first heard about Teresa of Avila. I was formally raised Catholic and went to Catholic schools for much of my upbringing. So I might have learned about her there. Further, I've always been drawn to strong female role models and to unraveling the mysteries of the life around and within me. In my teenage years, one of the places I used to explore these mysteries was within my writing, within my music. I had the privilege of learning to play piano, though I didn't always see it as a privilege. I often dreaded the car ride over to the bridge to West Hialeah to my piano teacher's house. It wasn't because I hated to play, I loved it. It was because I hated to practice. At least, I thought I hated it. I wasn't good at practicing remembering to find time each day amidst the increasing rigors of schoolwork and other extracurriculars was hard. Especially when I also wanted to spend time on the phone with friends or sitting for hours silently playing with Barbies or reading a book of poetry that captivated my short attention span. Yet, I did write my own music. Perhaps it was the precursor to the poetry that I write today. Teresa begins more than one of her texts telling her audience that she really doesn't want to write and that she's doing so out of a sense of obediencia, obedience. I was never someone naturally adept at keeping a schedule, a structure, and was most often my most creative amidst the disarray. And I think my dog, Foxy, who you just heard earlier, can attest to that still. My practices of close looking, of close listening, of careful observation were so sporadic that they seemed less like practices or disciplines and more like gifts of the spirit. 
I equated creativity to these spurts of inspiration. And words like obedience seem to kill creativity rather than invite it in. At the end of another work of hers, The Interior Castle, Teresa tells us she's happy that she was obedient, that she was proud of the writing she did for the order, teaching her sisters about prayer, about the interior life. I'm no Teresa. I'm not as prayerful, for one thing, or as obedient. In many ways, much of the work I'm attempting to do is learn how to create the spaces to meditate, to pray, to write, to feel the love that flows and ignites each of us. That's still probably my greatest challenge as I'm halfway through divinity school. As more of us find ourselves reflecting upon the spaces and places we might find solace, where we might find solace in our lives, let us remember that we are not alone in the work, that many before us, like Teresa, and that more around us than we might think, seek to open ourselves to the water and fire found in and around the sacred spaces we carry within each of us every day of our lives so that we might interrogate our histories and move forward with greater resilience. May we continue to open our hearts and minds and perceive the poetic spaces and places that continue to inspire the artists and creatives among and within us, quieting our minds and setting our own hearts and souls aflame.
Our closing words and chalice extinguishing today may be familiar to many Unitarian Universalists here. Some of the language, in fact, is found in our teal hymnal and was based off of, the, of a poetic prayer written by Teresa. As we extinguish our chalices, may we leave with the loving lyricism of Teresa's words in the original Spanish, bookended by them as shared with the sisters in her Carmelite order and translated in English by Aaron J. Cooney, inviting in her Eficacia de la Paciencia or Efficacy of Patience into the lives we choose to live and create in the days and weeks ahead of our own evolving histories. Nada te turbe, nada te espante, todo se pasa, Dios no se muda, la paciencia todo lo alcanza, quien tiene a Dios tiene, nada le falta, solo Dios basta. Let nothing trouble you. Let nothing scare you. All is fleeting. God alone is unchanging. Patience, everything obtains. Who possesses God, nothing wants. God alone suffices. Nada te turbe, nada te espante. Todo se pasa. Dios no se muda, la paciencia todo lo alcanza. Quien a Dios tiene, nada le falta, solo Dios basta. Amor y bendiciones a todos, much love and many blessings to you all. The fire in my heart, my soul.
blood, by body, by spirit. 